to feel blissful all the time. Hallmark movies are the worst. They're really cute, but everybody's always happy and, and things are all, people look beautiful all the time. And we're just sold on this idea of how things are going to make us feel. And then communication today is supposed to be instantaneous, right? We put something out there and we're supposed to instantly receive feedback between text and instant messenger and Facebook. We're supposed to hear back right away. And we expect that. Some companies, if, if you don't respond within a certain amount of time, you get in trouble. And how hurtful is it when you put your favorite picture on Facebook or you write something really profound and 24 hours later you still have no likes? And I think a lot of times, and that happens to me, so if you look at my thing, just hit the little thing there. Um, and I think a lot of times we put that same idea, that same pressure on our relationship with God. We come to church and we frequently focus on the good things, the way God makes us feel, you know, loved and safe and joyful, beautiful, taken care of. And we come and we talk about how God talks to us and how God is always in communication with people. And if you need guidance, God gives it. If you seek, God answers. And then we learn how God is talking to everyone around us. It's like they're on Bluetooth connection and they don't even need the phone anymore. And so when Blake asked me to talk, I knew that I needed to talk about this. And it, it's a hard thing for me to talk about. And when I was planning and putting together my thoughts, I, I sent it out for feedback. And I got a bunch of different feedback. Some people said, oh, it's way too harsh. You definitely shouldn't talk about that in church. It's just... And I got to admit, after the first service, I was thinking, what else can I talk about today? And then some people said, well, I mean, it's a good idea, but I don't know if it will relate to very many people. And then some people said, you, you need to do this. This is what you need to talk about. So here it goes. Some of you know I'm a chaplain in a hospital, so I'm in what you call vocational ministry. And a lot of people look to me and they expect that I'm best friends with Jesus and I have it all figured out. And I have to tell you that a lot of times... I feel like my Bluetooth is lost under my car seat or something, and my phone battery is dead. I pray, and I get no response. And I pray, and I, I don't feel anything. I long for those holy goosebumps, and if I get any, it's usually because I'm sitting under the air conditioning vent. And so I, I journal, and I can look back years and it seems like the same entry over and over again. And I actually brought my journal so I could read to you a little snippet. God, I'm journaling because I need to really hear from you and to know it's you. I know I've been distant lately. I've withdrawn. I'm feeling defeated and lonely because I feel you've been silent. I won't say absent because I know without you and your presence your grace, I would have no sense of happiness, hope, love, or compassion. Yet I don't hear you. And I'm jealous, God, of everyone who hears you, and it seems like it's everybody but me. I feel you momentarily when I see the ocean or I see my dogs. And I feel thankful and in awe, but that quickly fades. I need you to show me your face. I'm seeking it. Holy Spirit, please keep seeking it for me when I can't. I know you are really there. I know and I believe Jesus came and died for me. I guess that's faith. Where are you? What's wrong with me? I do love you, and I seek your face. It makes me sad, because I want that connection that so many other people seem to have. And I begin wondering, is my faith not good enough? Maybe it's not strong enough. Then I get scared because I think, is my belief a fraud? Is it not even real? 
And I, I've mentioned here before that I went to seminary and I didn't hear God tell me to go. I didn't see a burning bush. I didn't see a twig on fire. I didn't even see a smoking leaf. I just went. And sometimes when I pray, it just it feels empty. And I, I do not like to talk about my prayer life, so this is very hard for me. I have a, a co-worker who spends two hours every morning in prayer. She gets up at 4 a.m. And I struggle with that because I put so much pressure on it. God, I need to hear you. I need to feel you. And after a while, when you, when you seek and you get no response, it becomes difficult for me to keep going back. I'm the same way with people. If I reach out to somebody several times and I don't get a response, I just quit. It's kind of my MO. So how would I expect it to be any different with God? So we do talk about the times that God talks, and he does. And we talk about the times when we feel wrapped in the presence of God. But what about the times when God is silent? When God seems to be absent? And other people feel that way. It's not just me. (laughs) They say that most Christians will experience this on their journey with God. And many people have experienced it that we look up to and we consider faithful leaders of our faith. I want to read a few quotes. Where is my faith? Even deep down there's nothing but emptiness and darkness. If there be a God, please forgive me. Anybody know who said that? Mother Teresa. There are no lights in the windows. Might be an empty house. Was it ever inhabited? It seems so once. Why is God such, such a present commander in our times of prosperity and so very absent in our times of trouble? C.S. Lewis, the writer of The Lion, The Witch, and The Wardrobe, and many other writings. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from me, so far from my cries of anguish? My God, I cry out to you by day, and you do not answer, and by night I find no rest. David, in Psalm 22. And then we all know, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus, as he died on the cross. Mother Teresa is They're working on canonizing her in the Catholic Church as a saint. She dedicated her life to Christ. When she was very young, she became a nun, and she spent her whole life serving God because she knew that Christ loved her, and so she wanted to show other people that same love. And she spent her entire life working with indigent and infirmed people, the outcasts of her society. David, we know David, he's the man after God's own heart. And then Jesus, Jesus is the giver of grace. Jesus is our salvation. Jesus is God. And they all felt periods in their life when they felt abandoned, when they felt Jesus was absent. God. So today I want us to look at the book of Job. There are countless examples where God seemed absent to the people, but Job is one of my favorite books. Job is one of my favorite people in the Bible because he's very real. And I think a lot of people can relate to Job and to Job's life. So I do want to say that there are so many things to explore in Job, so many theological topics and themes but we would be here all day. And um, we had a seminary professor that wrote a book on Job, and it was 1,500 pages. (laughs) There's a lot of depth there. But today I want us just to look at Job, who Job was and and Job's life. So we're going to start in Job chapter 1, verse 8. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There was no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Job is a, is a perfect man. To worldly standards, he has it all together. 
living a comfy life, kind of the life that we dream about. The white picket fence and the kids in the yard. He has a beautiful family. He has a successful business. He's financially stable. And he has a great relationship with God. God describes him as a blameless and upright man. He probably is the kind that spends the two hours in prayer every morning. He's a good, good man. And then life happens to Job. So we're going to look at Job chapter 1, verses 13 through 20. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby, and the Sabaeans attacked and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword, and I'm the only one who escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The fire of God fell from the heavens and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I'm the only one who has escaped to tell you. Then while he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, The Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. And while he was still speaking, I'm sure by this point, Job just said, I don't even want to hear what you have to say. Another messenger came and said, Your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them and they are dead. And I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. So here we have this man who had this idyllic life, and suddenly a tornado was swept in, killed his children, and they're buried under the rubble of the house. His, fi- his, his fields have been swept up in a brush fire. His workers were killed in an armed robbery, and he was camel jacked, right? His camels were stolen. So he has a loss of kids, a loss of friends, a loss of income, and he can't even get around to tend to business because his camel is gone. I'm sure Job is thinking, God, where are you? I can't hear you. Where is God in this? And then it gets worse. Yep, it gets worse for poor old Job. If we look in Job chapter 2, verse 7, Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. So now he's sick. On top of it all, he's covered in sores and scabs. He's in pain. Probably no one wants to be around him because we know back then the people didn't understand a lot about sickness and they didn't like to come very close because they might catch it. And so he's itching. It says he took pieces of broken pottery to scratch his wounds. So here he is. He's grieving all of these losses. He's immensely sad. And now he's physically miserable. Where is God? I can't hear you. And I see this all the time. I have a a patient whose wife is probably dying. They just lost a child. They own a business, and because they can't work, they're at risk of losing it. He's exhausted. Where is God? And so here's Job. He's feeling totally isolated, can't connect with God. And here come these three friends. So you think, good, somebody to sit with him. And then they start talking, right? And they tell him, surely you have done something to deserve this. I don't know what your sins are, but they must be pretty big. Or your faith just really must not be very good. And so Job cries out to God, and he gets no response. And um, Job, I cry out to you, God, but you do not answer. I stand up but you merely look at me. Nothing. And life is like that, right? I don't know if you're battling cancer or something with your health and you're going through painful procedure and test after procedure and you cry out to God and 
and you ask for something and yet it seems that there's nothing. Or if you're, you're facing a, lay, uh, a layoff or potential job loss and your spouse and your kids depend on you for the money and you cry out to God for guidance and there is none. Or maybe you're like me and, and you're just... You're just down and, and you're so lonely and depressed and you cry out to God when life is status quo and you say, I can't live like this much longer. And it's silence. And I start thinking, did I do something to deserve this? Did I, did I do something to deserve the silent treatment? Or is my faith not strong enough? Is God even there? Where is God? And so, you know, we can wrestle with these things and we can come up with our own theologies and, and we do. We, we gain insights and can make sense of things, but we don't have to here because we have the answers in the book of Job. And there are places where God seems absent and the people are crying out, lamentations the entire book. I'm suffering down here. Life is miserable. I'm hurting. You've turned your back to me. I don't know where you are. But the book of Job is unique because we get both perspectives at the same time. We can see God. We can see where God is. We can see what God thinks of Job. And we can see it from Job's perspective. And we know that God says Job is, is a good person, right? He's blameless. He's upright. He's one of my most faithful servants. He loves Job. And so we can see that, that Job has done nothing to deserve this, right? Job has been nothing but a good guy. But life happened to Job. Fires get sparked. Tornadoes come. Hurricanes come. Weather happens. People make evil decisions, make bad choices. We were given free will, and some people, they just aren't very good at handling it. Life happens. There are germs. If there weren't, I wouldn't have a job. <laughs> there would be no hospitals. So why isn't God responding to Job? Why can't Job hear I don't know, maybe Job's friends got in his head and he started thinking, ah, maybe I really did do something wrong and, and I'm guilty and, and he's ashamed. And so he can't hear. Or maybe his head is just full of distractions. I mean, he's grieving all of these losses and how am I going to make money from now on and, and my camel, I got to buy a new camel. And he just can't hear. Or maybe his pain is too immense. He's hurting so much that there are no words for God to say. And it's funny because when people ask me as a chaplain, because a lot of people don't know what chaplains do, and they'll say, what do you do? And I'll say, I get paid to be silent. And it sounds funny because I went through a lot of school to learn how not to talk. Because I sit with patients who just learned they're dying and they're scared. What can I say to take that fear away? I sit with moms who just lost their babies. What words could I offer to take that pain away? I sit with patients' families in the ER who are battling between life and death what can I say to give them peace? Sometimes there are no words. Sometimes the, the only thing that provides any solace is silent presence. One case that I worked that will be with me forever, one of the most painful things I, I ever witnessed, was a young couple, beautiful, like from a Hallmark movie, and he was in a gruesome car accident, young children. And 
while the medical team was working on him for a long time, I sat with his family in the waiting room as they cried and they, they teetered between grief and hope. And all I could do was occasionally put my arms around her and offer tissues and fetch water. And then when the doctor came out and told her that, that he didn't make it, that he'd passed away, and she fell on her knees screaming, a scream I'll never forget. All I could do was kneel down next to her until she was ready to get up. And when I took her to see her husband, and she yelled at him, and she pleaded with him to get up, and she cried on his chest, all I could do was stand there beside her. Because sometimes our pain and our anger and our regret is so deep. It's so raw. I think God understands that there are no words. There is nothing to say. I think God weeps and grieves right along with us. And our emotions come. They're not wrong or right. Sometimes the way we handle them can be wrong or right. And it's been proven that if they're witnessed, it's healing. So maybe God is just allowing us the space to talk. And that silence can be so uncomfortable. <laughs> but sometimes it can lead to the deepest revelations about ourselves that we need in order to move forward. And I don't know about you, but... Often when I get home from work, I, I try to cook dinner, and I watch the news, and I talk to my family, and you know what ends up happening? Sugar ends up in the spaghetti instead of salt, and I say, oh, really, that's great, and then I realize they've just told me what a horrible day they've had. Because we can't focus on so many things at once. Our attention can only be in one place at a time. They've proven now that multitasking is not a real thing. That really what we're doing is we're taking all of our attention on one thing and then we quickly move it to the next and to the next while we pride ourselves on being able to, to pay attention and focus on all these things at once. But really we're changing the makeup of our brains and the human attention span is getting shorter and shorter. So maybe we're just missing it, right? I know God is powerful, but does he really want to yell over the car radio, the GPS, the phone conversation, and the honking cars? I think sometimes we need to turn down the noise so that we can hear. I think sometimes the voice of God is all around us, but it just blends in with the rest of the sound. And this is so hard for me. My brain never stops. And so when I do try to spend time in silent prayer and meditation, I find myself thinking about, what am I going to make for dinner? I still have to pick my clothes out for tomorrow. Oh, and I have to pack Ellie's lunch, and this floor really needs to be vacuumed. And then I feel guilty. Oh, my goodness, I feel so guilty. God, I can't even give you this. I can't even give you 30 minutes of my time. Five minutes of my time. And guilt is powerful, isn't it? One time when we were outside serving food, I know you guys know Richard, and he's become like family in our family, and I said something unintentionally that really hurt his feelings, and he was really mad at me. And I felt sick over it. Oh, because when people are mad at me, I can't handle it. I don't do well with conflict. I told Ellie, I said, okay, I'm going to text him once. I'm sorry, and that's it. I guess I'll never talk to him again. I didn't want to hear what he had to say with, to me. It was, that's just enough. And so I, I text him one thing, and I said, I'm sorry. <laughs> but God is gracious. Do you know what Richard texts me back? It's okay, I forgive you. Remember the story of the prodigal son? Right, that guy did everything against his father's wishes. He lived his entire life doing everything his father told him not to do. And when he returned home, did, did he get punished? Did he get fussed at? No, his dad threw a party. So I think sometimes 
We get so ashamed, you know, to, to approach the most powerful being in the entire cosmos. We're so unworthy. What is he going to say? Maybe we don't even want to listen because is he going to be mad? What, what's God going to say to me? But God is waiting, waiting to witness your emotions, waiting to, to guide you through life. And we are unworthy, each one of us. But Jesus died saying that you are worthy. And God is waiting. And I think it's also important to mention, this has helped me through the years as, as I've tried to figure this out for myself. I think God relates to us all differently. In the book of Adam and Eve, God spoke to Adam and Eve directly. But God speaks in many different ways. I think a lot of times we expect that and the way we talk about it, right? The language that we use. And I think some people expect that and then they think that that's the only way it works. But he talked to Joseph through dreams. He talked to the Israelites through Moses and countless other people. He talked to David through his music. I used to really feel the presence of God when I would run because my mind was focused. It wasn't distracted. I couldn't be. And I would see things and I would think things and and I just knew it was the presence of God. There's a monk that defined prayer as as the awareness of the presence of God in whatever activity you're engaged in. And I believe that. I think God speaks to some people through music, through art, through nature. For me, through journaling, because it's the only thing I can do to focus my mind. And other people. And I think this is really exciting. Because I think God uses other people to talk to us a lot. He used Moses. He used Jesus. And I know I'll be at the hospital and I'll be thinking, ugh, I just, everybody in my office is really good at this. And I don't really know what I'm offering these people. And I, I pray and it feels empty. And I just, I really wish that you would find something else for me to do and just send me home. And within five feet of getting off the elevator, there's a family right there, and they say, oh, there you are. You've helped us so much. I know you are doing exactly what you're supposed to do. I feel the presence of the Holy Spirit when you walk in the room. Am I really? And I think, okay, God, is that what you want me to hear? Do you want me to know that you are with me? So the next time, you know, somebody says something to you about, gives you a compliment about something that you've been doubting or gives you some guidance about a struggle that you've been having, as as long as it's good guidance, biblically founded, maybe we need to stop and thank God for that. So the thing that's really provided me a lot of comfort is the verse Psalm 4010. And everybody knows it. Be still and know that I am God. Right? It's on bumper stickers, t-shirts. We have it over a door in our bedroom. And a lot of people talk about it and we think about it because it says be still. Silence our minds, right? Sit and be aware of the presence of God. Just, just experience it. Take Sabbath. Rest. But for me, it sticks out for a totally different reason. It says, be still and know. Not be still and feel. Not be still and hear. We know because we can see the whole story. God was with Job the entire time. God was never absent. Even when Job couldn't feel it. Even when Job wasn't hearing God was there. Thomas, Thomas doubted, right? And Jesus didn't get mad. He said, here, go ahead, put your hand in my wound. But blessed are those who believe 
but haven't seen. Blessed are those who believe, who haven't heard, who haven't felt. So I wanted to share this with you all today because when I was in seminary, I really struggled for a period of time. It was like I walked in the door and I had a crisis of faith. What in the world? I didn't know what was going on with me. It scared me. I emailed my youth minister who had been an integral part of my faith journey and I told him everything and I received no response. Talk about silence, right? And I saw him years later and he remembered, he said, Brian, I'm sorry that I never responded to you, but I was having a really hard time with my faith and I knew I couldn't help you. And if he had just told me that, I would have been fine, right? I would have known it's okay. So I wanted to let you know, and I don't know if any of you were in this place, if any of you have been in this place, or maybe some of you will experience this place in the future, but it's okay. If God seems silent, it's okay. And sometimes silence is for short periods of time, sometimes it's situational, and sometimes it's long. The author of Lamentations never got an answer. But it's okay. It doesn't mean that God is mad. It doesn't mean that God is absent. We see in Job that God is ever-present. It may mean that you're so in sync with God that he doesn't have to tell you. He doesn't have to take you by the hand. It may be that your pain is so deep that God knows that there is no words to say and he's just raining compassion over you. Maybe you do need to turn down the noise in your life. Lower your distractions a little bit. Maybe you need to allow God to forgive you so that you can approach the throne of God without hesitation. But regardless of the cause of the silence, keep seeking, keep expressing your feelings and your doubts, and allow God to forgive you and be open to the many different ways that God may choose to relate to you. And I wanted to quote, close with a, a final quote because we shouldn't be ashamed to embrace the silence, to thrive within it. Oswald Chambers, who is a, a well-known theologian and author, he once said, when you cannot hear God, you'll find that he has trusted you in the most intimate way possible with an absolute silence, not a silence of despair, but one of pleasure, because he saw that you could withstand an even bigger revelation. So look out and just wait and see what God has for you. Amen.